Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Economic Empowerment Podcast. Today, I'm here with Carla. Can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. I'm Carla Raffold. I've been in cybersecurity for quite some time. Um, right now, I'm Chief Product Officer for an instant response company called Surefire Cyber. So first of all, can you please tell us a little bit about your company? Yeah, so Surefire does instant response. So we're the people that you call when something goes wrong on a cybersecurity way. If, if you've been hacked or you've got ransomware, then uh, then it's us that you call. And we have a team of really amazing people that are able to get you back up and running very quickly. And since we have the new integration of artificial intelligence, how do you think that plays into the role of you know instant response? So I think we're looking right now at what we can do with AI to make us quicker, make us a better partner as well to the companies that we work with, because it's often the insurance company or the attorneys that are calling us. So we're looking at how we can use that to make us a, a better partner. And then obviously, there's a lot of talk about how that increases the risk. Does that enable criminals, cyber criminals to attack more people or, um, you know, to evade our detection and so I think there's a lot out there about that that we'll probably see come to fruition over the next year or two and and like you guys are like instant response and stuff like that and do you think the integration of AI makes hackers like basically can just program anything and just run through it to as many people as possible which increases the risk of cybersecurity? not sure if it will increase that risk because that risk already exists um, right. the things that scare me are things that are less scalable now so um, one of the things that's been in the news recently is that the cyber criminals are threatening to call police forces to the homes of victims to encourage particularly hospitals to pay out their ransom demands so something like that that's not very scalable right now but you add in AI and kind of using uh, you know voice AI and to make those calls then actually all of a sudden you can do that on a really large scale and that sort of thing I think is really scary I see I see and do you think the cybersecurity industry right now is fragmented like in the sense that there's a lot of company that does a lot of different stuff. Yeah, and a lot of solutions. Is that what you mean? Lots of different Yeah, yeah, solutions. a lot of solutions and yeah, and things. And do you, are you like do you think consolidation is a good thing for the industry or do you think that more startup companies should appear to, you know, add to the ecosystem rather than consolidation? I think we'll definitely go through a period of consolidation. And I think that's just a natural period in anything. If I think back to kind of businesses that I've had, you do go through that where you add in more things. It's hard to manage all those things. So you try and consolidate, but then something new comes through, something better, a different right. solution that works for you. So I think that's just a natural cycle. I think that's compounded right now by a couple of different things that are going on in, in the cybersecurity industry. So there have been a huge number of vendors that have started over the last few years. So that's led to more vendors, more choice, more fragmentation. And then if you think about how available capital has been, or rather how not available capital has been for those companies over the last year or two, that has led to some of those companies going out of business, maybe being purchased at a time that they might not have planned to be. So I think consolidation is partly natural and partly kind of market conditions. I see. And from an industry's perspective, how big of a growth do you think do you think this industry will get in the next like by 2030 for yeah i mean if you look at all the research the predictions are pretty scary we're still looking at i think like double digit growth for cyber security right. yeah. companies and if you'd have asked me that a year ago i would have questioned how much further we had to go how much more are budgets really going to increase and you know if everyone's got to a kind of a good level of security how much more will we will we need to go with that but 
none of us really thought AI would be where it is right now. So or maybe some people did, but I didn't. So yeah. um, you've now got all those additional risks and all those additional risks of who you're giving your data to and where that might go and how we secure that. You know, any AI project that you're undertaking as an organization means you need to consume huge amounts of data. So you've just suddenly increased your risk and you're, you've increased the ways that, that people can attack you as well. So, you know, I think that growth suddenly looks very realistic. Yeah. Yeah. And I like I think like I saw those reports. I was like, that's a tremendous growth. And I just I asked that because like because like is that a more of an optimistic prediction? Or, because I, I remember Dominic said in the last podcast that he was like last year was actually one of the toughest years business wise for him. And some and um and you know like everybody is like looking into cybersecurity as a high recurring revenue industry. It's gonna grow so much and different th things like that. But from a in like from working in the industry, do you also feel that way? Being optimistic about the growth. I mean, optimistic feels like the wrong word because if the in if the cybersecurity industry is growing, it means that the attacks on us are growing, and that doesn't feel to me like a good thing. It does feel inevitable, right. uh, you know. As long as you have technology and as long as we have IP ideas, uh, money that other countries are going to want, then I think we're going to see that that risk continue. But yeah, I don't know if op optimistic just feels like the wrong word to right, me. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I completely see what you mean. And moving to an entrepreneurial standpoint, what have you, what do you think is the, your hardest challenge has been so far? Oh, that's a great question. So I often say, like, I think I have a really useful naivety when it comes to starting new ventures, where I think, how hard can that be? And then when you look back, you realize, it was incredibly hard and maybe if I'd have known how hard it was I wouldn't have necessarily done it um I think one of the hardest things I've done is actually selling uh probably the first company that I sold you know kind of going through that negotiation the due diligence just how you can communicate that to the people around you that was pretty hard to do I uh, see so, and from an entrepreneur's standpoint, everybody's looking to be the you know next Bill Gates, less like next Elon Musk and stuff like that. A lot of people don't really think about you know selling their startup company because they're just like, oh, it's like you know like an egg that I have hash. So like I don't want to just you know sell it away and things like that. So like they don't really prepare for that. So from like a previous like because you definitely have a lot of previous experiences. What are some best ways that entrepreneurs can prepare for that? That's a really good question. So, um, you know, where I work right now, our CEO doesn't like to talk about that. He's very focused on, I want to do the best job I can do today and the best job for the people around me today. And I'm really learning from that because that's, a, I think, a great mindset to have. It means he's super right. present, super focused, whereas I've always been focused on how can I build this to sell it, like the five-year, seven-year kind of plan to get to mm -hmm. an end goal, which I'm not sure, I don't know that I'm right on that. I think actually I really, really like the way that our, our CEO uh, right. approaches that. Uh, but how do, how do people approach that? I think you've got to, if that's really your goal, then you need to know what metrics people who might purchase you are going to look for to increase your valuation and focus really hard on those metrics. So for instance, in the, the first business that I had, being able as the founder, you know, not being um, necessary to the day-to-day -day running of the business, we knew that was a, a really key factor. So I focused very hard on not being integral to, to the business. So I think that's kind of one of the, the things that you do. What, what, do, what do buyers of your type of company look for? And then how can you meet those needs? Oh, hundred percent. And I think that like, I think it's just two ways of entrepreneurship. Some people, you know, build a company to sell it and some people just you know, really want to carry through. And I think it's good to have preparation of both. And like, by the way, like, I would like how you mentioned you have like, like a really great mindset coming into doing those startups. And, uh, and I think entrepreneurship, one of the hardest things is that like, sometimes you don't just don't see any hope. 
And how has that carried, like, how has that mindset helped you throughout that process of difficulty? I think you do. I think you get to a point, especially a few years in, where things, things are hard. Maybe you are where you thought you would be, right? Maybe you have hit all your numbers, but quite often we don't hit the numbers and the big targets that we set for ourselves or we've had unexpected setbacks. So that, that can be really hard. Um, I think I've always just been driven by, I know what I want the outcome to be. And it, I guess it always just seemed inevitable to me that that outcome would, would happen. And actually the businesses I've sold have been in markets where, yes, they're cybersecurity related, but you know, for instance, the first one was a, a recruitment company less tens rather than hundreds of uh, recruitment businesses get sold in the UK every year. There's something like 35 or 40,000 businesses and hardly any of them ever sell. Mm -hmm. And I think if I had really focused on that number, I probably would have lost hope and right. not, you know, yeah. it, it's that thing where I say, you know, I assumed it would be easy and then realize how hard it is. So right. But those businesses do sell, you know, if, if that's what you really want to do and what you're really going to work to and you can be realistic about the circumstances in which that happens, then, you know, I think anything is possible. I did see a lot of people that would want to sell, but they had unrealistic expectations of how right. that sale would come together. You know, yeah. I want all of my cash and, I, and then I want to walk away. Like very right. few deals come together like that. Typically, yeah. there's an earn out. And that's, you know, if, if you're focused on that, you're probably not going to get it if you're willing to be a bit more flexible uh, and realistic about what the market offers, then then I think anything can work. Yeah, because I, I think that happens because people are not knowledgeable about how to exit the company. They only start about entering. That's why I like I remember reading a research that was like people have a lot of logistics behind buying or entering in the industry or business, but they lack a lot of logic when exiting or selling their company. Thus, they're not as knowledgeable as well. And from a young entrepreneur standpoint, there's a lot of qualities that we need to develop and in order to become an entrepreneur or be a successful entrepreneur. So what are those qualities do you think are necessary? There's quite a few. One of them, I would say, is being really clear on what success means to you. You know, for me, growing and selling a business was like the metric. But I know plenty of people that do run their businesses probably more profitably than I did because that isn't their goal. Their goal is to do something they enjoy and to, to make more money than they would if they were working for someone else. And I think in cybersecurity, when you go through and look at you know, what do some of these founders walk away with? Some things that look like a great success might not really be that successful when you start kind of looking a little deeper and looking at, well, what did that really mean for how much money you took or where you ended up? And so I think really understanding what success means and not being driven by those top lines of, you know, raising X amount, exiting whatever your valuation, you know, what does it really mean? I think that's something to really think about. And I also think there's a stigma right now is that entrepreneurship is basically directly connected with money. It's like, oh, you want to get rich? Oh, be an entrepreneur, which I think that should never be the case. And, and a lot of people just get really stuck on the idea of, oh, make money. And that's just really stayed at the surface level. So how do those entrepreneurs can dig deeper and find the values of entrepreneurship? I think the ones that do really well are in it because they want to solve a problem, right? Like you right. really see a problem that you know you can fix and you're very passionately driven about the solution because, and you know, this is something I'm still learning, but I think the better the more focused you are on that, the more focused you are on doing a really good job, being a good person, being a good leader, the more those results come. When your focus is just on earning X amount of money and doing whatever it takes to get there, you're probably, maybe you will, but you're probably going to have a really difficult road. Right. And how did you develop that passion? Um. That's a very good question, because I think for me, in the, at least in the first business that I did, 
probably didn't have that I could a, a little bit but it was really about earning money and the the journey to exit the second company I did was a, an events company and I was much more focused on quality it was like the integrity of that business was incredibly important to me um, yeah. So I think part of that for me was just circumstances. And then as I've got older and maybe learned that chasing quality is better than chasing an outcome, right. um, I've been able to, to learn that and apply that in a different way. Because I think for a lot of young people to find a passion, like, like you said, like at first, everyone is lost. Like the only the only seemingly obvious answer to entrepreneurship is basically money. How much money can you earn? How do I get out of the current situation? Those type of things are what first drives them forward. And it's it's a big passion, but it doesn't. I feel like it really doesn't take you to too much places after you had your, you know, first let's say your first experience was entrepreneurship maybe it turned out great maybe it didn't and then like people who are really passionate about entrepreneurship fail the first time they want to try again but but like a lot of people who are driven by money are unable to do so because because the investment they put in is like a dead loss and which i think is really interesting because how do you think that you should develop that passion of entrepreneurship and instead of like and instead of shifting from you know just basically focusing at one like little goal of you know earning profit ideally you would find a solution or find a problem that you're really passionate about solving and actually if you're in you know the early stage of your career and you really do want your own business and you do want to be an entrepreneur that might not come that easily you know there's plenty of people who are in their 40s 50s and 60s that are probably still trying to find that and your passion also changes I think throughout your your life at different stages anyway but actually it could be a lot of pressure to say well you've got to find a passion that you could make money from and yeah. you know build a business around and yeah. that might not come early on you know you might need to take a little bit more time to uh, to work out what that looks like so the the other thing is you know can you just start you know I I have businesses that I started and that did fail you know probably in in large part because I wasn't necessarily passionate about them and I didn't really understand the problem but you know was probably passionate at the time about running a business and and being my own boss so maybe that is just part of the journey that actually having those failures is a good thing a hundred percent I think failure is necessary and um, and I think it basically guides you to know what your passion is a hundred percent and last question is like what is like one sentence that you want to share with people who are looking to start a company? I mean, I think just do it is probably, <laughs> it's probably yeah. that yeah. despite all of those things I've just said around, you know, how, you know, understanding what success means and everything else actually like it's a lot of fun it's, it's always me that's pushing my friends to go set up their own companies and pushing them to right. follow the things that I can see they're passionate about and there's a business in so I think it's a lot of fun and if you have an idea then give it a try there's there's generally not that much to lose right 100 percent. I totally agree with that it's a pleasure having you on the podcast and thank you so much thank you